For 37 years, Melbourne had an extra fictional suburb, Erinsborough. Street was named after my grandfather, remember? It was never clear where Erinsborough was, but its heart is in Melbourne's outer east, known on screen as Ramsey Street. Well, here we are on Ramsey Street itself. Let's just take a quick look around the street. The weather is absolutely ghastly. It became a place of pilgrimage for hordes of Neighbours fans from the UK and 20 years ago for me, a teenager whose friend had just got her licence and who I demanded drive us to the place we watched on TV every weeknight. I'm Margaret Paul and I'm going to miss having Ramsey Street around, which is why I want to tell the story of one of Australia's most successful media exports. Neighbours set rating records, launched some of Australia's biggest stars. So what are you going to do? Chuck it all in? Filmed nearly 9,000 episodes, including 63 weddings. Mr and Mrs Jared Rebecca. 20 births. <gasps> He's a boy! 68 deaths, including shootings, poisonings and a plane crash. We run out of fuel. And most of all, the show kept a lot of people in work in an industry that is notoriously boom and bust. Coffee? Cappuccino? It'll be very emotional. Um, I think we're all, we're all preparing for it now. It's incredibly sad because it's, you know, like, I suppose you could equate it to, like, when you finish school. And, you know, you've got all your friends all in the one spot and then, you know, you're not going to see them again. I love Neighbours and I love everything it's given, not just me, but given Australian television and Australian culture in general. I, I think it's one of the greatest things we've ever produced as a nation and I'm deeply sad that it's gone. I'm going to be really, really sad because I think it's, it's, it's one of those things where you just feel like it will always be there. What kind of neighbourhood is this? What about the crew? Mm. You know, They'll be it's scattered. a big worry and it's sad mm. because mm. they are fantastic. Fantastic. You wouldn't believe the amount yeah. of people who are going to be out of work. We're not going to have this uh, warehouse that's pumping out scripts 52 weeks a year so that people can learn how to make TV. What a terrible loss for the Australian industry that something that is going year in, year out is now coming to an end. Neighbours made its first appearance on our screens on March 18, 1985, and right from the start revolved around the lives of the residents of Ramsey Street. You're going to be our neighbours and we're going to live happily ever after. Yeah. Two years earlier, its creator, Reg Watson, had launched another soap, Sons and Daughters. Everyone thought Neighbours would be equally successful, but it wouldn't be so easy. Doctor, why are you sick of something? No, just a checker. Reg Watson returned to Australia from the UK in 1973 and took up the role as head of drama at Reg Grundy Productions. He had a string of hits, including The Young Doctors, The Restless Years and Prisoner. And then came Neighbours. And he understood that audience, he understood that kind of storytelling and understood how to make that sort of drama, that fast turnaround. And, and he was, kept it simple. Oh, brilliant. Yes. Absolutely. It was a brilliant concept. And he had the age range yes. from children through to grandparents. So there was something, somebody there for every member of the audience. His idea was for a show called Living Together. It was knocked back by Channel 9, picked up by Channel 7 as Neighbours. Oh, I reckon it could be a good thing for Ramsey Street. Axed a year later. Oh, no. Don't you go blaming me for this, Paul? And then picked up again by Channel 10. G'day. G'day. Someone move in, eh? You live around here then? Yeah, right next door. Just wonder what the new neighbours would be like, you know? They saw something that Channel 7 didn't see, but that's ratings that's that's weren't that's flash. That's and Channel, Channel 10 worked really, really hard at it for six months. They took the cast out every weekend to shopping centres around Australia and put them in front of the kids and just basically begged people to watch the show and it worked. 
especially with the addition of some promising new cast members. Charlene! And a flat out publicity machine. Yes, Carl. It's Kyle. Kai's birthday when this goes to air. He's 19! <laughs> But no one predicted what came next when the show was picked up by the BBC. At first it was screened at 1.30 in the afternoon until the head of the BBC had a conversation with his teenage daughter. Who said to him, listen, all of the kids are rushing home to watch this show called Neighbours, we love it. So he started repeating the show at 5.30 in the afternoon and boom. You know, when Neighbours started in the UK, that was kind of at the tail end of Margaret Thatcher's reign, and I think it was a pretty dreary place. And along comes this kind of burst of sunshine, this happy-go-lucky Australian show with people who live in beautiful houses with huge backyards and all this space to go outside and play cricket in the street all year round. You know, you've got the, the accountant living in one house and the plumber next door is the one with the swimming pool. Yes. You know. It, it reflected everything that the English the thought English about Australia. Thought about Australia. Yeah. And they love to live next door to their doctor, neighbour, and calling by his first name. That's unheard of. Yeah. Unheard of over there. Harold, please. Oh, I think Mr Bishop will suffice. We don't want the neighbours gossiping, do we? Oh, you're right, of course. I think most Brits watching that were kind of like, whoa, well, I like that. You know, I want to go to Australia now. So I think that was part of some of the original appeal of Neighbours. Now, we don't know if this is connected, but think about this. In the five years after Neighbours began, migration from the UK to Australia more than doubled. I have a cousin from Dublin who lives in Canberra and his mum has just been visiting and we all got together and she said that she blames neighbours for a lot of Irish people choosing Melbourne, choosing Australia as a destination, including her son who's now married to an Australian girl. We didn't know how popular it would be in the southern parts of Australia. Once you get a taste of it, you can't get enough. <laughs> Catherine Murphy is my friend and colleague in the ABC Melbourne newsroom, a city she chose in part because of her obsession with neighbours as a kid. It never rained. Everyone had a pool in the back garden. Everyone went to Lassiter's for coffee. There were no umbrellas. And where I lived, there was a lot of umbrellas. So it was just that beautiful lifestyle that you love to watch. Satisfied? By 1989, this show was pulling in 20 million viewers every day. Heard any more from your superstar boyfriend? Break off, Sue. Oh, I'm sorry if I sounded bitchy. I mean, it isn't everybody who gets to be with Grand Kenny for the night. It's bizarre to think about Neighbours going for as long as it has, because when you break it down, the premise of the show is a dead-end street. Well, originally it was written for kids. Originally. Now it's murder. Oh, threesomes. Threesomes, uh, yeah. What's wrong with threesomes? It's a whole lot of stuff. That... <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever floats your boat. <laughs> Voila! Oh, Clive, cover them up, please. They're disgusting. Oh, don't be so stuffy, Madge. Uh, well, no one swears in Neighbours, so you have to be imaginative about your swearing. To the extent that when we introduced... Um, Stingray Timmons, one of Toadie's young cousins, who was quite a long-running, much-loved character. Um, the in-house team at the time devised an entire sort of vocabulary of non-swear swear words for Stingray to use. And while it's produced its fair share of megastars, for many others, it's just been a really regular source of work. We produce two and a half hours of television in a week. Um, and we do it, you know, for 48 weeks of the year. It is a very efficient machine for making television. We should stay and watch. Might learn a thing or two. <laughs> so you almost start the week with a kind of grid of knowing which stories you've got to pick up from the last week and which sets are going to be really important so you know which ones you want to use and 
which actors you need in which episodes and who's got to cross over with who. You're an idiot. <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> it means that you get very strange things like people break up in the pub. <laughs> Sheila! And you go, why would they do it in the pub? You go, well, because we had that set. <laughs> Listen to me, I live here, this is my garden. I don't want you anywhere near it. I'm trying to help no, you out. I always think of it as a, as a fast-moving train. And every week, five episodes are plotted, five episodes are first drafted, five episodes are you know, second draft, five episodes are in pre-production, five episodes are being filmed, five episodes are in post. What are you doing here? None of your business? At least two crews going, um, one usually in studio, one usually on, on location, sometimes a third crew. And that machine just rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls. Sometimes, if an episode was running short for any reason, then you'd have to write what we called a filler scene. And a filler scene was just something where you literally got a call from studio saying, we've got these actors, we've got this set, and we need it in two minutes because cameras are ready to roll. And you'd sort of go, okay, I better think of something. They kissed. And it wasn't just a peck on the cheek, it was a full blown pash. When you're shooting this week's and part of last week's, and part of next week's, your continuity gets a bit fuzzy. That sounds very uh, fuzzy. But you do That's get through it in the end, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you get a bit... Mm, mm, mm. Dementia sets in. Yes, yes. What's really special about Neighbours is the number of people who were fans of the show at school who went on to get their first job there. I got home one day, I was in year 11, and my mum said to me, someone from Neighbours has called you. Uh, and he said to me, you've got some good ideas. When you finish school, maybe there'll be a job for you. So a new audition in Ramsey Street. Do you think that Neighbours gets the respect that it deserves? There are people who will uh, snigger a little bit, but by gee, I bet they'd pick up a 20-year contract. Channel 5 have been quite upfront about the fact that they're not axing Neighbours because of declining ratings, they're because there's still over a million people who loyally have watched Neighbours uh, every night. The reason that Channel 5 say that they're cancelling Neighbours is that they want to spend the money on making more UK productions. 1690 episode 887 on take one. The final shoot is just weeks away. This is my first and last chance to see the Neighbours back lot. Oh my goodness, look, it's actually Lassiter's. Any Neighbours fan knows what Lassiter's mean. There's obviously Paul Robinson's Hotel Empire and every Neighbours fan has got their own memories of storylines that have happened here. Sorry, Rochelle, did you want something? No, it's fine. Ty and I used to share it. This is the outdoor set of Neighbours and it's actually smaller than it looks like it is on television, but this is the entire Erinsborough community. Are you out? The, the hearing was brought forward. Yeah? Because this is all about revenge, isn't it? This is about making the people suffer who put you in jail. But then next door to that, we've got the Rebecca Law solicitors. If you want to come and have a chat to Tony about your family law issues or not going to court. I'm back. I thought you might be. Well, across here, we've got Erinsborough Real Estate. If you wanted to buy into this booming market, you've got the waterhole down there if you wanted to catch some live music or grab a beer. <laughs> An exotic dancer at the waterhole. Have you lost your mind? And this is Harold's Cafe. You probably remember this place as the coffee shop. Yes. It's nice to see that Harold's left his mark. <laughs> so you could sit outside, have a little cappuccino, maybe have some fried chicken waffles. Let's see if the door's open and see what we can find inside. Oh, yep. So it is just, this is just a set. So obviously the, um, the Harold's Cafe interior is a shot elsewhere, but this is the exterior of Harold's Cafe. <laughs> When the show decided to renovate its back lot, it turned into one of Neighbours' biggest moments. A cliffhanger season finale with the return of supervillain Paul Robinson. Quick, there's been a big explosion. There's a guy been blown off his feet. So, huge day in the writing room when they came in and said you can burn down Lassiter's. We were like, oh, oh my God, it's like a gift. And then um, as the smoke parts for the final shot is Paul Robinson standing there. And it was just, we all, we'd written it and we still screamed when it happened, when we saw it on screen. And one of my students just the other day said he remembers that so clearly as a child. 
because his mother was such a fan and he remembers just hearing her scream, it's Paul, oh my God, it's Paul. <laughs> but doing big scenes on a soap opera budget is not easy. The day you disappeared, I mean, that was sad because it was supposed to be a roaring, <laughs> wavy <laughs> sea. Yeah. And uh, it was like a mill pond. Oh, where's he gone? He was there a minute ago. There's a sign. What's wrong? That swell can be dangerous at times. Oh, no, don't be ridiculous. He's there somewhere. <laughs> they were so, throwing I mean, rocks. He must have jumped no, in. The, 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 the <laughs> camera was concentrated on that bit of water and they were throwing rocks in there to make it look as if it was rough. Literally throwing yeah. rocks. Oh, in. literally, yes, yes. So, I mean, that was a bit embarrassing. I found it rather difficult to be screaming your name. <laughs> wow. And this calm scene. Harold! Answer me, love! Harold! Harold! I mean, it looked as if he committed suicide. Yes. Right. Instead, I just walked to Tasmania. You did? Yes. yes. Negative, negative. We will not make Stanley. We have not enough fuel. I was involved with the neighbour's plane crash, which I don't think we would get away with now. It was, um, we had to cull some cast, basically. We had a situation where we had too many casts, and so we had to kill some off. We thought, plane crash. Let's do a plane crash. That's great. We ran out of fuel. We crashed him into Bass Strait. Bass Strait was the, the Man O' Man pool. I don't know if you remember Man O' Man with Rob Guest pushing the dating show, pushing the guys into the pool. That was where we filmed it. So the Man O' Man pool stood in for Bass Strait. And of course, there have been some absolute shockers. Neighbours will never live down what was probably their worst ever episode where Bouncer the dog had a dream that he was marrying the dog next door. Dogs don't dream, Dave. If Bouncer did, I reckon he'd dream about a big, nice, juicy T-bone. the script was there a bit of a like <laughs> <laughs> awful I really really <laughs> said you've got to be joking I really said that you know, I went up to the front office I said please come on <laughs> anyway <laughs> he was such a lovely animal that he deserved he better he was. <laughs> The show came in for much more serious criticism because of its casting. It wasn't diverse enough on screen. It didn't reflect really any version of Australia at that time in terms of, of um, diversity and especially not where it was purportedly set, which is the, the middle eastern suburbs of Melbourne. Dad! No probs, mate. Got this one sassed. The criticism about Neighbours being too white and not reflecting Australia actually came from fans in the UK. And that's because they were comparing Neighbours to their soaps like EastEnders and Coronation Street, which did become a lot more diverse. It was vanilla. Mm. So there was nobody gorgeous. indigenous. There should have been actually um, Middle Eastern Precise. people. There Precise. should have been China, Chinese. That was what Neighbours lacked, and I was critical of that. I'm sorry. What for? I'm sorry for saying you ate our dog. It was very rude and ignorant of me. Well, I suppose I accept your apology. Thanks, Raymond. <laughs> Well, I think that the criticism um, is, is very fair of, of the show in the early years because there was very little diversity um, and there was very little diversity anywhere on television. The show tried to introduce an Indian family in 2011, but a year later, they were gone. You can't just parachute in an Indian Australian family or a Chinese Australian family and go, cool, we're done, we're diverse now. That is a process that begins with who is telling your stories. So. 
there was again an effort to bring more diverse people into the writer's room so that the stories that you're getting are reflective of, of the people that you have in the room. In the last few years, the show's had Asian, Aboriginal, gay and trans characters. But in 2021, Aboriginal cast members allege they were racially abused on set. Do you think the show could have afforded to bring in that diversity a bit sooner? I, I, absolutely, I would have liked to have seen it happen earlier, but it's happened in the time that it's happened. Um, and I'm just glad it has. After so many years of inequality, change has finally come. And partnerships like Aaron and David can be celebrated as legal unions, as they always should have been. Well, being here at Lasseter's Lake, this is pretty special. And for Neighbours fans, if you know, you know, everyone's got their own personal memories of this rotunda here at Lasseter's Lake. For me, this will always be where Stephanie Scully was left at the altar by Mark, the horrible fiancé who'd had a kiss with her sister. I'm so, I'm so sorry, I can't do this. No! diabolical things to them all. Um, <laughs> Carl had another affair. He left Susan for Izzy. Well, you have spoiled my life. You have destroyed my happiness. And I am not understanding. From now on, Carl, expect nothing from me but hatred. I hate you. Um, well, we killed Madge. Oh, have you, my darling? Killing Madge. I, I actually still feel really guilty about it because she was an icon, that character, a total icon. It was a mutual arrangement. A full, a full, yeah. They wanted rid of me and I wanted rid of Yeah, them. but if it ain't broke, don't, you know. <laughs> Go to Paris. Me. The producers came to us and said, OK, Anne's leaving the show, um, you can write her out and you can actually kill that character off, which is an exciting day for writers, very exciting day for writers. Yeah, it was what? a pretty oh, um, it, it was an emotional icon. week, really. It was difficult to play, but it was very rewarding. Yeah. And I was very thrilled with the way it was written. And it was a really emotional thing. It was actually really interesting because we wrote it, thought, aren't we clever? And then we watched the tapes, as they were then, that came back from studio and we all just bawled our eyes out and thought, oh my God, that's like losing someone, you know, family. <laughs> oh, <Bert. laughs> and I actually had the experience that Many years later, when I was over in Europe, I was at a party in Amsterdam, I was chatting to some people, one of them was Australian, neighbours came up, of course, and I mentioned that I'd been involved with Killing Madge, and this woman's face, she looked at me and she said, that woman was like a grandmother to me, and she walked off, never spoke to me again. <laughs> but nothing would ever top this moment. The show's most famous episode, Scott and Charlene's Wedding, had 2 million viewers in Australia and 20 million in the UK. I'll always remember Charlene walking up the aisle in that dress, which was stunning at the time. It was definitely a dress of the time, but that really emotional song. And you literally, if you didn't know how to talk about that wedding at school the next day, you had nothing to say in the playground. Charlene, you're okay! <laughs> In 
the years that followed, Neighbours was sold to more than 60 countries and it also exported its famous production model, which is why there are local versions of the show in countries like Poland and Germany. Neighbours was the first show in the world to return to filming during COVID. They invented guidelines and techniques to split the cast into four different quadrants and film scenes with actors being isolated. Um, people didn't kiss, uh, if, if people didn't, if you had a fight, people didn't actually physically touch uh, and, and suddenly the phone began to ring and then uh, ring in the New York Times uh, were on the phone and productions all over the world wanted to talk to us. <laughs> There must be something I could do. Don't have a spare pair of pants in that bag, do you? Thank you. But not long after filming started up again came the news that the show's major source of funding, the UK's Channel 5, was pulling the plug. I can't believe that you're actually leaving. Oh, I'll be back soon enough. You know me. So what was it that finally killed off Australia's longest running drama? When Neighbours started, we only had five TV channels. And now we've got all these streaming services and there is more television drama being made now than ever in our history. So how many people still have time to devote two and a half hours a week to a soap opera like Neighbours? But you know what the big question is? How do you wrap up a story that's been running for 37 years? I see it as a, as, as a big, joyous, big hug. To, to the audience and and to each other for those of us that work on the show. So it's certainly not blowing up Ramsey Street, not blowing up Lasseter's. How could I? Um, again. Again. I had to do my homework because I got home late. Remember, the X Files is homework. It's science. I've watched a lot of people grow up on here and and, and then go off on their adventures, and I feel like now, after all this time, now. I'm about to go on my adventure. I'm a bit inclined to bring back all the favourites. I am, because that's what made it what it is. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'd love to see a big nostalgic <laughs> game of yes. street cricket down Ramsey Street. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, yes. the cricket ball smashes a window. Yes. And, as it did. As it did in those <laughs> opening credits. And yeah. Harold coming up. That's right. You can't do that. Right? That's wrong. Right. I think they'll get it right because Neighbours is a show that has always respected its history. And might as well put that in too. Mum, that's your hair dryer. Well, you've always used it more than I have. Anyway, you've tangled the cord up so badly, I might as well buy a new one. Oh, thanks. You're beautiful, you know that. No, I'm not. Well, I think you are. We do know that Kylie Minogue and Jason Donovan were brought back. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. We knew that there was a, a, a secret shooting happening, but nobody knew what it was. We all guessed, though. <laughs> it, it, it didn't feel right to me to finish the show without them, and it was just a beautiful experience for them, for us, and I think it will be for the viewers. I love you. I would probably end it fairly sentimentally, I have to say. I would, you know, have Harold return in his caravan and drive up the street and have dinner with Susan and Carl and put the bins out. Something as simple as having a cup of tea and one of them walking out the door and saying, I'll see you tomorrow, and closing the door and the lights turning off, to give the sense that this suburban life will continue, it's not an end, Carl and Susan are still going to be there, Tony's going to still be popping in for a cup of tea to talk about his problems. Um, don't worry, neighbours will still go on without you. 